from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Katie Greifeld in New York. In for Emily Chang, this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Musk's latest subpoena, the whistleblower who used to run Twitter security. He says the company has been incompetent with bots and privacy. Is that enough to sway the court's opinion? We'll discuss. Plus, the tech industry's most prestigious business incubator, Y Combinator, has named its first American, Asian-American CEO. I'll chat with Gary Tan about what to expect under his leadership. And Bitcoin falls below 20,000 as investors respond to the Fed's hawkish stance. So how will the world's largest crypto perform during a recession? We'll try to answer that question. But first, let's get a look at the markets. And after that big drawdown that we saw on Friday, calm down a little bit in terms of losses, but still decidedly risk off. You look at the S&P 500, you look at the NASDAQ 100, both firmly in the red. And those chips, once again, underperforming the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index off by almost 2%. On top of that, you did see two-year Treasury yields rise a little bit as investors tried to recalibrate some of their Fed bets. But let's talk about Bitcoin. This is interesting. We're once again talking about 20,000. You can see during the summer, we kind of broke above it a little bit, but we know crypto and Bitcoin in particular tends to move in 10K increments. That's why you see sort of a staircase pattern on the chart behind me. So with us back at 20K on Bitcoin, are we going to 30 or are we going to 10? We're going to try to answer that question, but let's also check in on the meme trade because that's really been sort of one of the narratives that's emerged over the last few weeks, seemingly out of nowhere. It continued today. You saw some of the speculative corners of the crypto market, the miners up there posting some gains. Then once again, you had Bed Bath & Beyond just crushing it up almost 20 5%. And some of the originals, too, you had GameStop notching gains of about 2% on a down day in the broader markets. But speaking of memes, let's listen to how some of the Bloomberg television guests are reacting to this moment. Memes come and go quickly. Same thing goes with these prices. Volatility down, stock market up, a perfect precondition for some more meme stock action. Towards the very, very big picture, there's a price discovery and market efficiency and all sorts of things that do uh, adhere to fundamentals a little bit more. GameStop has been steady. Uh, and so the interest there from the retail world has, has maintained better than some of the other stocks. Uh, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond, I think there's a, probably a lot of factors at play here. GameStop is still not sustainable at the price that it's at if you use fundamental analysis. For leadership to be you know, maintained in those areas, um, we wouldn't think that's sustainable moving forward. So we've seen a turn both in terms of the general market environment and in terms of people interested in once again, uh, playing equities, getting involved in capital markets. And the two of those things together, I think explain why we're seeing a little bit of a, a meme stock resurgence. Let's get more from Bloomberg's Bailey Lipschultz. He joins us on the phone. And Bailey, actually the Markets Live blog over at Bloomberg News just ran a survey on this topic. Will the meme mania fizzle out? Almost two thirds said no. So let's start simple. Why? Katie, I think it's a com combination of factors like some of the guests for Bloomberg TV mentioned is just that you have free trading applications like Robinhood. You have the ability now for retail traders to buy far out of the money call options. You also just have the sense of camaraderie and really community that uh, platforms like Reddit and StockTwit have founded. So you, when you look at it, kind of the confluence of those uh, kind of factors, you see it continue to pop up here and there. And that's something that we saw uh, most recently last week with Bed Bath & Beyond in particular. But that really does date back to even the Hertz days of late 2019 uh, when this trend of retail traders kind of taking up and picking up uh, the ability to trade kind of came into vogue. And Billy, if I think about the last two years of uh, living through and reporting on this sort of meme craze that still is continuing in markets, these stocks used to sort of trade as a block. If one was up, you could bet the other was up. You could sort of see a little bit of a break apart here now, though. Are we starting to see any sort of fundamental stories return to some of these names? 
I wouldn't say it's fundamental. The more investors I talk to and strategists is that each has their own story, and that's really what we saw play out in the summer of last year. When you look at it, GameStop obviously kind of listed all boats, was the type that listed all boats back in January of 2021, but then AMC really caught fire in the early June, late May area when CEO Adam Aaron embraced retail trading. When Then you saw that kind of play out with Bed Bath & Beyond with its own wave with Ryan Cohen's stake, which he is subsequently dumped. So really, you're looking at it where there's not really fundamental reasons for these rallies, but Bed Bath & Beyond is set to give a strategic update on Wednesday. So that's another event for speculative investors to play, which is something we saw play out today in particular with call options uh, on Bed Bath & Beyond kind of by itself. Well, let's dig into Bed Bath & Beyond because actually one of the questions in this survey was which stocks of these will go bankrupt within a year? You had GameStop, Bed Bath & Beyond, and AMC 45% expect Bed Bath & Beyond to go bankrupt within the next year. What are we expecting to hear on Wednesday? The big focus was laid out by Morgan Stanley. What they're looking for are comments on cash burn. This is a company that's been continuing to burn cash in the last few years, dwindling dwindling its cash position down from over a billion at one point a year ago to now closer to 100 million. So looking for cash burn, comments around vendor support, because we have seen that Bloomberg report from about two weeks ago, that maybe they weren't getting uh, good supplied because they were running back on payment. And another thing is just looking at current trends going into the holiday season. This is really, according to Wall Street analysts, a make or break stretch for Bed Bath and Beyond going into uh, the fourth quarter and what that could mean for a company that really, uh, when you look at it from a fundamental basis, is kind of nearing uh, the end of, at least according to some, what could be uh, a potential life. Make or break stretch. Uh, definitely watching with bated breath. But Bailey, I know you also cover SPACs in addition to memes. And when I think about SPACs and memes and crypto, it sort of all boils down to that same speculative urge driving these bets, at least in my view. Is that fair, though? Is it fair to lump SPACs in with some of these meme names? Uh, It really depends. Obviously, when you look at the SPAC trade that played out, when you go back to uh, Virgin Galactic in 2019, turning into DraftKings in early 2021, which really set the stage for the craze where pretty much any celebrity or uh, investing kind of titan had a SPAC in some way, shape, or form, it just kind of caught the enthusiasm and energy of a market that seemingly was a bull market that could not run out of gas. And that really is why I think Uh, When I talked to some of my sources, SPACs got caught up with meme stocks, again, with some of these alternative cryptocurrencies because there was so much froth in the market that it was able to uh, have some of these speculative corners of the market really kind of go mainstream and be adopted by professional traders as well as retail investors. Bailey Lipschultz, Bloomberg News. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Coming up, how startups can change their strategy to raise capital in the current environment. This is Bloomberg. Restoring price stability will likely require maintaining a restrictive policy stance for some time. The historical record cautions strongly against prematurely loosening policy. The Federal Open Market Committee's overarching focus right now is to bring inflation back down to our 2% goal. Price stability is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve and serves as the bedrock of our economy. Without price stability, the economy does not work for anyone. In particular, Without price stability, we will not achieve a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. The burdens of high inflation fall heaviest on those who are least able to bear them. We are taking forceful and rapid steps to moderate demand so that it comes into better alignment with supply and to keep inflation expectations anchored. We will keep at it until we're confident the job is done. And that hawkishness from Fed Chair Jerome Powell just crushing the risk on mood that we've seen from markets in recent weeks. And of course, that shift in sentiment does not bode well for fund ups seeking starting, seeking funding rather. Here to discuss is Christina Ross. She is CEO of the financial software startup Cube. Christina, you recently raised $30 million for your Series B funding round earlier 
this summer. Obviously, that's a much different environment than your Series A round from just a couple of years ago. Compare and contrast the difficulty. So our Series A was about 18 months prior. So it was end of 2020, beginning of 2021. And that was really the beginning of the party. So this was the time when unicorns were being crowned nearly every other day. It was the world of endless capital without guardrails. And we've now moved into a world where certainly the sentiment has changed, but we're going back to good old fashioned business fundamentals. So for us in particular, we are a planning company and we did plan for this. And our business model is really lends itself well to both good times and bad. So when times are good, we're a sword in the sense that uh, companies need to allocate capital in the most effective way possible. Uh, that's actually harder to do than it looks if you think about all of the companies out there that have blown billions of dollars. And then when times are challenging, it's really about extending runway. So we like to say, while cash is king, runway is queen. Um, and we help companies to do just that. Runway is queen. I'm going to write that down and use that. But this $30 million that you raised in your Series B, what are you spending the proceeds on right now? And is that different than what you might have planned to spend it on had uh, this sort of risk-off vibe rippled its way through asset classes? We would have definitely been more aggressive in our go forward growth targets. So there was almost a joke going around the startup ecosystem last year of six to eight X is the new three X, meaning companies are going to grow seven eight hundred percent year over year, which is what VCs are expecting. Three um, X, of course, was sort of the the gold standard for growth. What we're now hearing in terms of um, of sentiment is three years is the new 3x. So going back to how we're spending this capital, we're looking at extending runway for a longer period of time, whether rather than growing aggressively to the point of maybe putting ourselves in a position uh, that 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 growth is difficult to achieve or maintain. Um, so I would say that that is definitely something different than uh, the world of 2021. Uh, but we are in a really great position to get to either a path to profitability or extend our runway as long as possible. I'd love to extend expand on that a little bit. How do you expand your runway in a market environment such as this one? So going back to core business fundamentals, uh, every company, especially a tech company, has to think about how much they're willing and ready to invest in R&D. And for us and our investors and for our customers, this is an area that's really important and we don't want to pull back. We could certainly get to profitability faster if we pull back on R&D because that doesn't generate immediate revenue, uh, but is more of an investment in the future. Where it comes down to us is really solid execution around our go-to-market. So that means we're looking at a lot of predictions measures around how well our go-to-market is, um, is performing. So we look at things like magic number, which is how much we're spending each quarter versus how much revenue it's generating in the following quarter. And a good or best business practice is for that magic number to be somewhere between 0.75 and 1. Um, and that's something we're doing to extend runway so that we're very efficient with the capital we use. Um, and one of my favorite um, sort of business, uh, I guess, coaching lines actually came from the Netflix show Cheer, which when the coach was saying, it's, you know, it's not about what the other teams are doing. It's what we do here on the mat. And for us in our company internally, it's about how we execute internally um, and how efficient and effective we are at leveraging the capital that we already have. That show made me feel so inferior, but I'm glad that you pulled something away from it. But Christina, yeah. someone who recently went through fundraising, who recently worked with VCs, I'd love to hear your perspective on what's top of mind for those VCs right now? What are they looking for in potential investments? First of all, it's good old fashioned business fundamentals. And I'm a former CFO, so I love to hear it. I love going back to basics. The, the numbers that are really top of mind for most investors today are your gross and net dollar retention. So great, you get customers, but how well are you retaining them and growing them? That's the most effective use of capital. How quickly and effectively are you growing? Some of those terms like magic number, so a lot of things around go-to-market fundamentals. And more importantly, of course, I haven't mentioned cash yet, but your burn rate and your burn ratio. So how well are you using the cash that you already have to generate either additional growth or moving towards profitability? So a very uh, one of my favorite metrics is the rule of 40, which mm -hmm. looks at how much... Um, profit you have versus how much growth and trying to get to uh, or above the number 40 or 40 percent. 
And so if you were to give an advi advice to a startup who is trying to attract funding right now, who is trying to capture the attention of some of those VCs, what advice would you give them to sort of tailor their strategy in this environment? So right now, what I'm hearing is most startups are not advised to raise right this second. If you can extend runway, that's not just going to be, you know, through business fundamentals, but also looking at other external sources like debt. So if you can't raise equity, look for a line of credit or another way to extend runway, maybe reducing burn, whether it's reducing your growth rate or reducing the amount of R&D, depending on the type of business you're in, are just ways to extend capital till we get out of, I would say, till we know a little bit more of when we hit the bottom of the market, or at least when investors are confident enough to start really investing heavily again. Debt is cheaper than equity. I've heard that one before. Cube CEO Christina Ross, great to spend some time with you. Really appreciate it. Coming up, the US and China are near a deal to avoid stock delistings. How might it impact your portfolio? We'll find out. This is Bloomberg. Well, the U.S. and China are nearing a deal to avoid mass delistings over audit supervision. This agreement lets American auditors go to Hong Kong to check the records of Chinese companies listed in New York. But if the agreement falls through, more than 200 U.S. listed Chinese companies face delistings from American stock exchanges starting in early 2024. Here to discuss is Strategy Risks founder and CEO, Isaac Stonefish. Isaac, great to have you with us. In your view, how likely is it that this agreement actually goes through? I think it's very likely that the agreement will go through. What I'm more uncertain about is whether it will solve what the U.S. government wants it to solve, namely equal treatment for Chinese companies and U.S. companies and other global companies, and whether or not it will actually stem the tide of worsening U.S.-China relations, which seem increasingly likely to lead to all-out conflict or war. And do you think such big, big hurdles such as that could ever be solved? Is there any agreement that could go through that would satisfy all of those requirements? No. No. Okay, well, let's talk about the ramifications here. If this doesn't, of course, this agreement, like you're saying, doesn't go far enough in your view, but if it doesn't go through at all, what are the ramifications of that? What is actually at stake here? It seems what the Chinese side is doing is buying time. There still are roughly 18 months or so until the companies would have to delist. I think probably the idea is we'll sign this, the U.S. side will try to implement it, they'll find a lot of stonewalling on the Chinese side, and by 2024, things will be different enough that we'll be able to keep moving the goalposts and keep pushing the can down the road and figure something out then. It, it doesn't feel like this is a very big concession. It feels like this is a very good stalling technique so that companies on both sides and investors on both sides don't see Beijing communicating that they're not really open for business. So if that's the future we're looking forward to, that the goalposts just continue to move forward, just a series of stalling techniques, do you think that we'll ever actually see these delistings go through? It's a great question. I, I think the question of whether or not these companies will delist will depend so much more on the macro environment at the time. Mm -hmm. So we saw significant delistings earlier in the month from several large SOEs, presumably because they didn't want any U.S.-linked auditors anywhere near their books. I think it's possible that if U.S.-China relations worsen, certain companies will delist, maybe not even because of this, but because of other considerations. And I think certainly a lot of promising Chinese companies are finding it less appealing to list on U.S. markets and are looking closer to home for their capital raises. So why is that? Why is listing on U.S. exchanges maybe not the holy grail or the big goal that it might have once been? A lot of it is Beijing and the Chinese Communist Party's increasing paranoia about data and data security. And a lot of folks believe this has to do with Beijing really 
fearing that the U.S. is going to go to war with China against Taiwan if Beijing were to seize the island. And national security is really coming into the forefront. There's an expression in China that in China, politics dominates. And I think we're seeing that not only with domestic politics, but really with foreign policy and national security as a major, major force driving Beijing's decisions. Isaac, who has more to lose here if we make it sort of a binary conversation? I mean, is it more important for a Chinese company to list on a U.S. exchange, or is it more important for that U.S. exchange to have those Chinese companies? That's a great question. I think it's pretty even. I think from a broader perspective, it's investors who lose because of less choice, less efficient markets. And really what we're seeing on both sides is the U.S. and China prioritizing national security. And that's what governments do. And that's what investors often don't like governments to do. But that's really the new reality, the new base case for U.S.-China relations. So investors thinking about various equities should really have a national security strategy in mind as they make decisions. And Isaac, going with your expectation that really we just continue to stall and stall, what do you think could happen along the way in terms of the Chinese tech crackdown, for example? Do, do, we, do we expect to see delistings even if not forced to, for example? I think that's really possible. And I, I think one thing investors have to keep an eye out is both Beijing and the U.S. is worried about U.S. companies in China and Chinese companies in America. So if, for example, this seems to move forward and then there's some corruption allegations against a Chinese company on the U.S. exchange, Beijing could retaliate against an American company in China. It's also possible that investors start to feel like the markets in the other country are a lot less appealing and the governments respond accordingly. I do feel like there's a lot of people with large positions in China who want you to believe that this is business as normal, and it's really not. And Beijing has been very explicit about that. So this, to me, is not the key signal. This is part of the noise. All right, Isaac, we have to leave it there. Really appreciate your time, though. That is Strategy Risk's founder and CEO, Isaac Stonefish. Coming up, Twitter's whistleblower, now subpoenaed by Elon Musk's team. What that means for the rest of the trial next. This is Bloomberg. Let's move on to the Musk Twitter drama now with the Twitter whistleblower now subpoenaed by Elon Musk's lawyer. That whistleblower, Peter Zatko, claims Twitter officials didn't know or care to find out how many of its accounts were spam and bot accounts. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Kurt Wagner for more on that. And Kurt, the argument that has been made is that Zatko's claims could help Elon Musk actually walk away from this deal over those spam accounts. Does that theory hold water? You know, I think it's a little more complicated than that, right? I mean, what the whistleblowers basically said was that Twitter has not done a good job with security and also not a good job with identifying how many bots are on the service. And and when he says that, he's really meaning in total, right? How many of all the accounts that are on there, how many are bots? He, He claims that Twitter has no idea. Now, where it gets a little bit more complicated is that Twitter's argument has long been that, hey, it's fewer than 5% of the accounts that we uh, you know, count as monthly active users and share with Wall Street, right? So they're kind of talking about two different things here. What I do think uh, matters here is that this whistleblower is a top senior executive at the company, reported directly to the CEO, who basically is painting a picture of a company who's you know, mismanaged and, and not taking these issues seriously, right? So whether or not the data he has is going to help Elon Musk, I think he's painting a picture of a company that hasn't taken the bot issue nearly as seriously as Twitter wants you to believe it has. And theoretically, Zadko would know, but is there any world in which this subpoena could actually backfire on Elon Musk? 
I mean, sure, if, if he goes and, and starts uh, answering a bunch of questions that basically confirm that even though maybe Twitter doesn't know how many bots are total on the service, they're making their best guess, right? They're, they're doing the best that they can to uh, uh, create this number that they share with investors. That's really all Twitter has to do and has been saying that they've been doing for years, right, is they are doing their best to calculate this stuff. So if for some reason he comes out and, and you know some of these answers start to show that Twitter did put some thought into this and did handle this uh, in the best way possible for investors, you know, certainly that seems to, in my opinion, defend Twitter's argument a little bit here. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the Twitter side. How would you expect Twitter to respond to the subpoena? Well, they ha they declined to comment on the subpoena specifically. I imagine that uh, you know they too are very interested to hear what um, Zach Coe is about to say. They have subpoenaed a bunch of people, um, and and I'm sure that they would love to you know ask some questions of of him themselves. But they have since come out and said you know that everything that he said in this whistleblower complaint is false. They said it was uh, uh, you know mischaracterized. All the things that you would expect a company to say to someone like this. Um, and so, you know, again, no comment specifically on his subpoena today, but they're clearly, uh, you know, unhappy with what he shared thus far and, and, you know, claim that it is not accurate. And Kurt, I know that you are living and breathing this case, but for the rest of us, what should we keep an eye on next? Yeah, well, there is going to be a shareholder vote in a few weeks, and it feels a bit like a formality, but I think it's an important one, right? Because this feels sort of like the last hurdle that Twitter has to really clear to show that they have done everything in their power to make this deal happen. And so that's going to happen, I believe it's on September the 13th, so in just a few weeks. And again, if shareholders come and, and approve of this deal, then it's kind of uh, Twitter can say, hey, look, we've done everything we said we were going to do. We'll see you in court. So I think that that's a big moment um, that's coming up just after the holiday. All right, plenty to keep an eye on. Bloomberg's Kurt Wagner, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Coming up, as crypto follows the sharp adjustment in U.S. stocks, where is it headed and what does it mean for institutional interest in the space? We'll discuss next. This is Bloomberg. now for our crypto report and Bitcoin still hovering around $20,000. This is risk appetite wavering following Fed Chair Jerome Powell's speech on Friday, stressing that interest rates may have to stay elevated to stamp out inflation. Let's bring in blockchain capital partner Kinjal Shah for her read on this. Kinjal, great to have you with us. At this point, how much is Bitcoin and the crypto space, space broadly just a macro trade? Thanks for having me. You know, I think Bitcoin and the crypto markets more broadly have certainly expanded into broader tech over this last cycle. And I think we're starting to see that get reflected when it comes to um, macro comments coming from Jerome Powell and sort of the general market sentiment tending to sort of edge away from risk. Um, I don't know if that's going to continue for you know the long term, but it certainly is, I think, a result of of how the markets have behaved in the past 24 months. We also have crypto contributor Shanali Basic on set with us. Shanali, it definitely feels like uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell spoke and crypto listens. <laughs> crypto did listen, even though it's trading lower than where it was a week ago, Katie. You do have that lift back up just a little bit today in the last 24 hours. Kendall, the, if you look at what's happening here, of course, the macro is driving so much of the story, but there's also some single name events when you look at a lot of the tokens that are trading, Ethereum being one of them, when you see what happens to Avalanche on the downside, uh, some news over the weekend driving the price a lot lower. How much do the fundamentals matter here? You know, I think there are going to be short-term narrative-driven, you know, moments as there are with any sort of equity or, or asset class more broadly. However, the fundamentals, I think, continue to matter. I think that the long-term investor is still paying attention to the fundamentals, and that's really going to be driving a lot of investment. 
As far as investment goes then, how much are you thinking about valuation? There's a lot of question about whether Ethereum just has a lot more room to run given that run up with in Bitcoin we've seen over the last several years. Is that something that you believe or do you believe that the merge can create some more complications ahead? You know, I think the merge is a really big milestone for the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, you know, this this transition I think is going to have a lot of ramifications. Um, whether that's related to institutions being able to, you know, allocate to Ethereum more um, heavily than they have in the past, as well as um, certain fundamentals around the issue issuance of Ethereum itself, I think this is going to be a really big milestone. It's it's unclear if that's, um, you know, being sort of reflected in the price of Ethereum today. That's something I certainly don't. Um, don't have the the ability to sort of see into, but certainly think it's going to be a part, big part of the discussion in the next six months. Kendall, I want to talk more about institutions in the crypto space because a narrative that I've picked up on over the past few months is that this big volatility, this really dramatic drawdown that we've seen across the crypto landscape is going to scare off some more of those traditional players, those big institutional players. Has that been your sense as well? My sense is that a lot of institutions and enterprises more broadly have been getting really smart on crypto assets more broadly and are using this time as a way to implement strategies and sort of uh, figure out exactly what they what role they want to play in these markets. You know, even today we heard an announcement from Meta announcing the ability to post your NFTs across Instagram. I think that's a big sort of strategic move that's been in play for a number of months. And I think we'll see similar reflection on the institutional side as they've been putting sort of the pieces in place into what that looks like. Well, Kinjal, speaking of Meta, if I think back to this time last year, or even six months ago, I was hearing a lot about the metaverse. I was hearing a lot about Web3. It feels like those conversations have sort of petered off as we've seen this big market volatility. When are we going to start to see a rejuvenation in that space? Does that ultimately tie back to what the Federal Reserve is going to do? Yeah, you know, it's it's difficult to know exactly when sort of markets will will um, come back to life. However, I will say that founders and teams continue to build in the Web3 space as well as the metaverse. There are a lot of really interesting projects that have been funded over the past 12 months that we're going to start to see execute and ship on their roadmaps. And I think we'll start to see some great um, engagement and use cases really come to light over the next uh, you know year, year and a half. Well, there's also just a lot of dry powder on the sidelines when you look at how much money has been raised in the venture capital industry. Is there an opportunity now that valuations seem to be stabilizing a little more? They've come down quite a bit. Where are you placing your bets? Yeah, we continue to think at Blockchain Capital that this is one of the most opportune periods to engage with bright founders that are really focused on the long term. You know, we're doubling down on infrastructure, I think, as a really key theme for us, whether that relates to scaling existing blockchains, privacy more broadly, powering consumer use cases. I think infrastructure is a really interesting space to be in right now and something that we're spending a lot of time on. I'm curious about some of the existing companies that you've placed your bets on over time. We're seeing some really interesting changes here in, in what some of them are doing. Think about Coinbase, for example, and how it says that more customers will be using its staking services. I'm curious as to how consumers are going to be interacting with some of these companies differently as we look to what crypto looks like coming out of uh, this most recent winter. Yeah, I think companies like Coinbase are really trying to put their users in the best position given the market changes. So as staking becomes more of a mainstream use case, enabling their millions of users to be able to get access to those products, I think is a really big value prop for folks like Coinbase or other exchanges that have that ability in their in their um, you know product suite. On the other hand, we're seeing Entry points for retail users really proliferate across the open protocol ecosystem, whether that's using DeFi protocols or more consumer-oriented NFT communities. I think um, everyone's entry point into, into Web3 looks a little bit different right now, and so really trying to ensure that there's a, a, a place and a use case for, for everyone. 
And when it comes to Web3, I mean, I'm just fascinated by the idea of the internet on the blockchain. And I've heard it both ways, that you could see uh, some of these TradFi players come in, some of these more traditional companies that aren't necessarily crypto native come in and build Web3. I've also heard the case that, no, it has to be someone who's native to the crypto industry. Where do you fall on that debate? And when you think about the own bets, your own bets that you're placing, I mean, are you more likely to invest in a crypto native company or maybe someone with a little bit more experience coming from the realms of traditional finance? You know, I think every company is its own sort of use case to think through. However, I will say there is a certain something special that comes from being crypto native and really solving for pain points that you're seeing within this ecosystem. Crypto and Web3 more broadly is very focused around grassroots organization and community really giving ownership back to the users of the products that we see. And so I think being crypto native is really important to the ethos of how um, how you can build a product in crypto and how that really can scale over time. That's not to say that financial you know, institutions and sort of Web2 companies won't be able to build some really great products and, and ideas in the crypto space. But I will say that um, being digital and crypto, crypto native is certainly, I think, a unique um, advantage. And I'll put another question to you along those lines. You know, when you're invested in everything from Uniswap swap and Sushi Swap to Coinbase and Kraken, centralized or decentralized, which is the way of the future? You know, it it really is a spectrum. It's it's certainly not a um, black or white question in terms of you know whether the the world is going to look completely centralized or decentralized. And I think that's something that's really become clearer and clearer over the past few years. At Blockchain Capital and, and um, you know, more broadly thinking about the market, we really want to back uh, founders and products that are solving for customer pain points and for real problems that, that they're facing in the market. And I think that's going to continue to exist on the spectrum. Blockchain Capital partner Kinjal Shah and Bloomberg's own Shanali Basic. Great discussion. Thank you both so much. Coming up, we're going to speak to initialized capital founder Gary Tan. He's coming back to Y Combinator. More on that big news next. This is Bloomberg. Gary Tan, one of the founders of Y Combinator and currently the managing partner at Initialized Capital, will come back to Y Combinator as its president and CEO early next year. He will also be the firm's first Asian American chief. Gary Tan, I'm pleased to say, joins us now for more on this news. And Gary, in many ways, this is a homecoming. What brought you back to Y Combinator? You know, for me, Y Combinator is truly sort of the beacon for opportunity. And, you know, for me growing up, you know, I, tech gave me everything in my life. You know, I started my life actually as child of Chinese immigrants and, you know, sometimes food insecure. We were sometimes, you know, we were in one bedroom, two bedroom apartments. I got my first job uh, making web pages and that helped me pay for the down payment for their home. And I just remember uh, going to ycombinator.com slash apply and putting down what my idea was. And they met me, they gave me an interview, they funded me, they put me in this community and that community changed my life. And so at the end of the day, I just know that that is what we can keep doing for thousands more people, you know, possibly way more than that. And that's really the goal. That's why, you know, I, YC gave me so much and, you know, I, I wanna give back. So you start early next year as president and CEO What's top of your priority list, if you had to pick? You know, one of the things that has been incredible for me that, you know, I want people to know out there, YC is a place where the alumni help each other in such a fundamental way. And I'll tell you a story of uh, when I was in YC in uh, summer of 2008, um, there was a company that uh, most tech people know called Heroku that, um, you know, they were on their way uh, they did, of course, go on to get acquired by Salesforce, and it was great, one of the biggest exits at the time for Y Combinator. But I remember those founders coming and telling me, hey, this is how you raise your seed round. This is how you actually do it. And they gave us their secrets. They t said what they said in those conversations, and they gave us the words to do it. Six months later, 
uh, you know, we were running one of the biggest Rails websites on uh, the planet called Posturus, and they wanted our source code. <laughs> Mm. Because they said, well, we need, we're a hosting service for Rails and we need to be able to handle, you know, the, the biggest website. And, you know, normally in technology, nobody would ever do that. Like the source code is your crown jewels. But we said, you know what, here it is. And we helped them. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that happens every single day. Like these aren't stories or you know, access to information that you can get at a conference mm -hmm. or, you know, sitting next to someone, you know, at, even, you know, at the top business schools, like the, this is real, really advice and resources from people who are the best in the game. Uh, and you can just apply online and anyone has access to it. So that, you know, that is still super unique and so powerful in the world. And Gary, of course, you are Y Combinator's first Asian American CEO. And when you're seeking to fund VC founders, how important will diversity be for you? You know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, at Initialized, I'm super excited about Jen Wolf and Brett Gibson sort of stepping into the roles of managing partner at Initialized. And I really have to just recognize Jen Wolf as a, a true leader in sort of bringing diversity to, you know, even actually the fund itself, you know, Initialized is actually the second most uh, diverse fund in the world, according to the information. And, you know, at the end of the day, what is investing about if not trying to build the world that we want to live in? And well, Gary, talking about the world that we currently live in, the markets have seen just incredible volatility over the past few months. We heard from Jerome Powell on Friday, sparking even more volatility. If you think about this period of higher interest rates that we're heading into, how has that affected sort of the startup world and some of the investments you could be funding? You know, I think one of the very lucky things about um, just early stage investing period is if you look at these times of great crisis, really great work is done. So, you know, when people thought the web was deader than dead, that's when Facebook was created. When people thought, and actually I was in the least successful Y Combinator batch of summer 2008 because <laughs> Lehman died. I remember but, that. Which was crazy. And, you know, uh, friends of mine now, Brian Chesky and Joe Gebbia and Nathan Blatharchik actually like they went through Airbnb, they, they went through Y Combinator with Airbnb the year after. And that was the batch where Paul Graham said, you know what, there might not be a demo day because there might not be any investors. So the blessing is, you know, whether it's a good economy or a bad economy, if you pick a problem space that's real, if you can use technology to attack really big markets, those are actually the times when some of the biggest opportunities present themselves. And so, you know, rain or shine, you know, I think YC in early stage, it's, uh, you know, things have adjusted a little bit. Mm -hmm. They've slowed down a little bit, but this is good, this is healthy, and it's good for the ecosystem. Well, let's move beyond some of the early stage investments. I would love to get your thoughts on the IPO market because it's really, really dried up over the summer. When could we start to see some of those companies coming public? Well, you know, it's like Warren Buffett says, right? These things are in the short term popularity contests and in the long term, they're weighing machines. And when you're talking about IPOs, well, the, the weighing machine is uh, not willing to give multiples that a lot of people want. Um, you know, I, it's hard for me to predict, to be frank, um, when this will happen because it's sort of separate from sort of the day to day of these startups, which I know really well. Um, I, I really hope that, you know, a lot of the macro sort of situation uh, resolves itself and that, you know, I think there are a lot of indicators out there that say that inflation is over, but, you know, I'm not exactly the right person to pay attention to there. Like, you know, what we can do is tell our early, early stage mm -hmm. and growth stage founders, be thoughtful about your cash, build something of true value, and, you know, don't build something for just that next round or to be able to sort of impress that next VC. It's really about impressing your customer, your user, high retention, high gross right. margin, and, you know, great customer acquisition cost versus LTV. That's, you know, the fundamentals. And that's what we try and teach every day in and day out early, early. Gary, it is great to get some time with you. That, of course, is Gary Tan. He is Initialized Capital founder and partner and soon to be Y Combinator president and CEO. Thank you so much.
That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Tuesday, we're going to speak to Coursera's CEO to discuss growth in education technology. And don't forget to check out our podcast. You can find it on the terminal as well as online on Apple, Spotify, and iHeart. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.